Hello, <laughs> and welcome to SciShow Quiz Show. I'm Hank Green, and for the first time ever, I'm hosting SciShow Quiz Show, uh, and I am the one who gets to ask the questions and know all of the answers, and you can't have them. The askee will be the asker. That's right. Oh, I know all the answers up. to every one of these questions. Alex Trebek up here. Today's <laughs> contestants are Callie Moore, the curator of the University of Montana Fossil Collection and Real Life Miss Frizzle. And we also have Blake DePastino, the editor-in-chief of SciShow and Real Life Indiana Jones. Oh. Ooh, that's a good one. I yeah. do have a work-related whip in my office. That's awesome. <laughs> Why is it not here? Why are we not cracking a whip right now? <laughs> I didn't know about that, and now I have a lot of questions, but we'll get to those after the yep. show's done it taping. Halloween costume. Oh, okay. okay. There we go. I don't know if that's work-related. Um, because it's in the office. <laughs> I was just worried. It's just a management about... tool that I use. <laughs> the content team will explain. <laughs> okay. Um, and the reason we have all of us, and Michael Aran is not here today, is because we are all the hosts of Eons, a YouTube channel that's doing really well. I love what we're doing there, mm -hmm. and there, every episode comes out. I'm always really excited to watch. It's um, a ton of fun to do. Yeah. So, so thanks, thanks for working with me <clears throat> on that, and I'm yeah. happy to be working with you on it. I have a uh, funny anecdote about that show, if I can inter interject. Man. I was just talking to Nick Jenkins, who's the director of Eons, and I said, hey, I'm going on SlideShow Quiz Show, and he said, who are you competing against? And I said, Callie, and he went, good to know ya. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> so, I, think I get the sense that I'm going to have my own liver handed to me in this well, game. I don't know. I don't know. I'm very limited. <laughs> We're trying to avoid your areas of expertise. Yeah, there okay, you go. Okay. Both of so. your areas of expertise. Well, I, um, yeah, that's, for me that's a lot. Yeah. But I don't know. So, but, if we can impress people with our knowledge, maybe they will go watch Eons. Oh, okay. So pressure, no pressure. Pressure's on. <laughs> oh, oh um, you could do. You could try it that way too, I guess. Uh, I also want to say thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, we have chosen two of you at random to uh, get prizes uh, for you are representing those people. Uh, Callie, you're playing for Dennis Kibler, and Blake, you are playing for Christina Bialik. So if you win, you Christina. get stuff either way, no matter whether you win or not. Everybody's a winner here. You're just playing for pride. There is a loser. Yeah. And it will be one of you. <laughs> uh, now, Stefan, show <laughs> our players what they can win. Oh boy, here we go again. Dennis and Christina, it's time to learn about what you can win today. Everyone's gonna be taking home the signed cards from our final round with our contestants' final guesses and wagers on them. The winner of today's quiz show will get an I won SciShow quiz show pin and some top secret SciShow swag from DFTBA.com. And the loser of the show will be able to soothe their broken dreams with a pin that declares them the loser of the show. The anticipation is killing me. So let's get on with it. All right, so the way this works is both of you start out with a thousand SciShow bucks. Uh, for every question you get correctly, you'll get 200 SciShow bucks more. And for okay. every question you get incorrect, you will lose a hundred SciShow bucks. And so mean. I have no idea why this is the way that it works. What if I refuse to answer? <laughs> You cannot refuse to answer. Okay. Can I challenge Kelly to a dance-off instead? No. Oh. You can, can, are there lifelines? No. <laughs> can you do, it, can you do it like Game of Thrones, where you have two people fight for your guilt or innocence, and then whoever wins, no, you can't do that, that would, either. Uh, okay. So this is uh, a question-answering yeah, game. Uh, okay. Just to be clear, yeah. <laughs> we just don't want, we don't want people gaming the system. Uh, so you have to answer the question. And we have to hit the thing first. You can if you want to. Okay. Cool. It kind of doesn't work very well. It's a, so. it's a button. Yeah. It's a tap light from the 90s. <laughs> With a cat sticker on it. It does have a cat sticker on the back. <laughs> so we've done a lot of SciShow episodes about the topic of our first round. And that's mostly because of Blake. Because every time you come back from traveling, you have like a bunch of questions that you want to answer, and then you answer them, and you write SciShow episodes about them. But <laughs> somehow, there are still a few aspects of the science of travel that we have not covered, and that is the topic of this first round. Okay. Number one, questions about airplanes. You might have noticed that plane wings have these little pods sticking out underneath them. They look a little bit like engines, but that's not what they are. They are called flap track fairings because they contain the mechanism that moves the flaps on the wings, but they also have another important job. The question is, what else are flap track fairings used for? A, reserve fuel tanks. B, reducing drag. C, warming up the wings to prevent ice buildup. Or D, keeping the wings from bending too much. B. Correct. Yes. 
They are there to reduce drag, which is what most of the plane is there yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I figured. That was the, that was the softball, I feel like. I feel, yeah, I feel like this is Blake's round and already. Yeah, I was thinking about something else. I was lost in your eyes. <laughs> the answer is B. Reducing drag. Most commercial jets cruise at around four-fifths the speed of sound, which is where aerodynamics can start to get even messier than usual. That's the point where shock waves start to form around the plane, because even though the plane isn't moving faster than the speed of sound, some of the nearby air gets pushed faster than the speed of sound. These shock waves lead to what's known as wave drag, which is a really strong form of drag that you want to minimize. That's why we have flap track fairings, also sometimes called anti-shock bodies. According to a physics principle called the area rule, when you're traveling close to the speed of sound, having abrupt transitions between bigger and smaller cross-sections of the plane leads to much more drag, and that's bad. In commercial jets, the most abrupt transition is between the area by the wings, which is pretty big, and the area of the plane just behind the wings, which is much smaller. So the flap track fairings stick out of the back of the wings to give that cross-section a little more area and a little less drag. Number two, this next question is about something weird on the inside of planes. Airplane windows are actually made up of three panes of glass. There's the one on the inside, which is basically a cheap layer that is meant to be the one that gets all scratched up, and then there are two on the outside of the plane that are both built to withstand all the stress that comes with being an airplane window. It's a hard job. Uh, <laughs> but. Have you ever noticed that there's a little hole at the bottom of the window through the two inner panes of glass? Why is that there? A, to equalize the pressure with the inside of the plane. B, to help firefighters break the window in case of an emergency. C, to increase the overall strength of the window. Or D, to give the window some flexibility as the temperature changes. <laughs> Um, A. Correct. Dang it. Yeah. I don't like that was a pretty easy one. But that's cool, yeah. Because yeah. you don't want them like blowing up like a balloon in there. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Oh, like the bad. way that your chip back Although does. they are all equally plausible answers. Um, what do you I like disagree. about that question? Well, I mean, I, why would a firefighter need to break a, like a plane window? window? They have You're not gonna, like, so you can like oh. pass a baby through it? It's not very big. <laughs> <laughs> like, here, take my dachshund! <laughs> <laughs> Schmoopy must live! <laughs> The answer is A, to equalize the pressure with the inside of the plane. Having a hole through a window might seem strange because airplanes are one of those things that you really want to stay sealed, but there's a good reason for it. Even though the outer two panes of glass are designed to withstand the difference in pressure between the outside and inside of the plane, the middle pane is meant to be a backup in case the outer one fails. But if both outer panes have the same stresses all the time, if the outer pane breaks, the middle one probably will too. By drilling a hole through the inner and middle layer, the air in the cabin can get in between the outer and middle panes of glass, meaning that only the outer pane of glass has to deal with a pressure differential. Then if the outer pane cracks or breaks, the middle one is basically good as new when it has to take over, and the tiny hole isn't really a problem. It's way too small to depressurize the whole cabin. All right, number three, enough about planes, let's talk about cars. In almost all cars, there's a black band running around the edge of the windshield and windows, which usually transitions into little black dots before you get to just plain glass. All that black stuff is called frit. Usually there's a bunch of these little dots at the top of the windshield too, where they help block some sunlight and make it easier to see, but the band around the edge of the glass also has another purpose. What is it? A, blunting the edges of the glass so it's less sharp, B, keeping the glass from shattering as easily. C, sealing on a UV protective coating. Or D, keeping the glue on the glass from degrading. C. I also say C. Well, you... <laughs> <laughs> All right, then you both lose 200 points. Yes. Why, would you, why would you not If I go wait? down, you go down with me. No, that's... No. No. <laughs> no. That's totally how it works. Uh, well, I don't know what to do in that situation, except that you both lose 200 points. That was Ooh. unnecessary, Blake. <laughs> um, it is I D. like that answer. It is D to keep the glue on the glass from degrading. Huh. Yeah. Right. What if I don't so accept go. that answer? Well, we're going to have somebody tell you all about it right now. Okay. The answer is D, keeping the glue on the glass from degrading. Frit is made from a type of ceramic paint, and it's there for a few reasons. One is pretty simple. It helps the adhesive stick to the glass so your windshield and windows don't fall out of your car. That's important. But even if the glue stuck just fine, the UV light from the sun could degrade it over time, so the frit helps block out that light. The thing is, when the glass is being bent into shape during the manufacturing process, the band heats up much faster than the rest of the glass, which can distort what you see through it. The dots between the band and the glass help smooth out that distortion. Plus, they make the transition a little less ugly. So the situation is, I said 200, but I meant 100. You both lose 100 points. I'm just not very good at remembering how the rules go. It's my first time. 
It's round two now. This one is not so much about a subject as it is about a tendency. The tendency for scientific words to sometimes be extremely entertaining. <laughs> All right. So question number four. Sometimes terms in science are just unpronounceable jargon to anyone outside of the field, but other times scientists tell it like it is. And the technical terms are very descriptive and also sometimes kind of hilarious. That tends to happen a lot in astronomy, actually. Researchers are often trying to describe something that's just very hard to explain without using words like spaghettification, uh, which is the term for the stretching and squeezing that can happen inside a black hole. So the question is, which of the following words is not a technical term in astronomy? A. Sloshing. B. Seeing. C. Fuzzball. Or D. Gunk. Oh, you're waiting for me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sloshing, seeing, fuzzball, gunk. A. A, sloshing? Sloshing is a thing. Sloshing is a thing. Okay, now so now I can answer. <laughs> yes, now you can answer. This would be an appropriate time. You have Seeing, slosh ball, or gunk? Fuzzball. Seeing, fuzzball, fuzz ball or gunk. <laughs> uh, they all, yeah, uh, I'm going to say seeing. Seeing is a technical term in astronomy. Oh! The answer, my friends, is gunk. And now we will find out why. The answer is D. Gunk. In astronomy, sloshing refers to pockets of cool gas sloshing around in galaxy clusters. The term was coined in 2001 by a team of researchers at Harvard, and since then, astronomers have been finding more and more examples of it. Seeing describes the clarity of the image you're getting with your telescope. So if it's a clear night and there's not much turbulence in the atmosphere interfering with the view, you'd say there's good seeing. Fuzzball is a concept from string theory, the idea that the universe is made up of tiny vibrating strings. In some versions of string theory, black holes are called fuzzballs. The basic idea is that instead of having a singularity at the center where gravity becomes infinite, inside of a black hole is a bunch of these strings. Gunk, on the other hand, is not an official thing in astronomy. At least, not yet. Number five. The next question is about diarrhea. <laughs> That's diurea, a type of molecule that gets its name from the fact that it's two connected molecules of urea. <laughs> I knew that's but, where you were going with that. <laughs> It's more than just a funny name. Diarrhea is used all the time as an industrial chemical, and weirdly enough, the name also has to be pretty appropriate for what it's used for. So, what is it used for? <laughs> a. As a thickener in grease. B. To melt ice on planes. C. To clean septic tanks. D. To dissolve strong adhesives. The kind that glues your glass in place and you need that, that frit there to prevent. <laughs> anyway. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you got for me? C. C, to uh, clean septic tanks? No. Oh, nerds. Ooh. All right. So is a thickener in grease to melt ice on planes or to, to dissolve strong adhesives? I'm gonna go with the dissolve strong adhesives. No, the answer is as a thickener in grease. Weird. You wanna put a bunch of diarrhea in your <laughs> grease to make it thicker. I was thinking urea, like a lot of animals have urea in their pee. That's what I was thinking about septic tank. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <gasps> yeah. Tricky. That was tricky. I bet you could, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, now we'll find out more about that. The answer is A. It's a thickener in grease. Yep. There's diarrhea in industrial lube. That's fun to say. Grease is generally made up of two main components, a base oil and a thickener. Diarrhea is often used for the thickening part, and so are other polyureas, molecules that have multiple connected ureas. A big problem with grease is that it can react with oxygen and degrade over time. And if there are metallic elements in the grease, they can act as catalysts, making those reactions happen faster. Many thickeners have metal in them, but polyureas don't, and that's why polyurea grease is so useful. It lasts much longer without degrading. Now you might have noticed that none of these questions have so far had anything to do with with natural history or paleontology mm. or even animals and that was on purpose for obvious reasons because yes. we don't want you to just know all the answers. But this last question, the one where you get to bet as many points as you would like, as long as you have them, is about an animal and that's all I'm gonna tell you about it. Now you will place your bets. And while they're doing that, we'll go to commercial break if it works, which it usually doesn't. You guys p point it up? Mm -hmm. All right. Africanized bees, aka killer bees, have a strange history. I'm gonna tell you all about it right now. They were bred on purpose in Brazil back in the 1950s as a hybrid African and European bee. Because people are crazy. Well, <laughs> well the, the European bees were gentler, but they did not thrive in the South American climate, while African bees did well, but were more aggressive. The hope was that the hybrid bee would thrive and stay gentle, except it 
did not lose the aggression. And then, in 1957, a bunch of hybrid bees escaped the lab ever since. They've been spreading throughout South America and all the way up into the southern U.S. These bees are so aggressive that hundreds of them will swarm people at once, and about a thousand people have died from their stings over the last six decades. But the name Killer Bee doesn't actually come from their history of killing humans. It's from another unfortunate behavior. So what do they do? Is it that A, they spread a chronic bee paralysis virus, B, they take over nests of European bees, C, their swarms damage crops, or D, they kill entire herds of cattle to get to the flowers in their pastures? No, you gotta write it on the card. You gotta write it on the card. Oh. And then we'll find I undo out. My... You, both get to, you both get to see if you were right or wrong. Oh. All right, let's see. I would like to preface this. Mm -hmm. By saying this is unfair because Callie knows things. I don't and know. And the fun a lot fact about, about me is bees. I know zero facts. You just you brought them back. Right, you, you were just a filter. It comes through your head. It does not stay in there. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. Just, well, every time you learn something new, something else has to like get out of the way. You know. It so. just pushes old facts uh -huh. out. Right. I had the you same feel problem. Like it. That's right. That's why I've stopped learning things. Have you guys done Japanese hornets on this? It's so awesome. These little cute little honeybees attack these hornets, and they surround it and they vibrate. Until oh, they yeah. increase so they like, the and temperature they and they like yeah. bake the hornet. Nice. I was hoping that was where this was going. No, that's yeah. a good way to kill a hornet. Yeah. It's not how I do it, but just get right up close to it and <laughs> <laughs> probably wouldn't work as well for me. So, now, display your answers to your cameras now. We've got B, question mark, or the cattle thing. Without a question mark, <laughs> I have, a, I have to tell you, Blake, you're wrong. But Callie is right. Yes! <laughs> there yeah. you go, Dennis. They came take back. Over, sorry. They take over the nests of European bees. They kill the, the bees kill bees. They don't kill people. They do kill people, but that's not why they're called killer bees. The answer is B. They take over nests of European bees. The name killer bee is really a bad translation of what the Brazilians called these hybrid bees. They're known as assassin bees in Portuguese. And that's a much better description of what they do to European bee nests. Small swarms of Africanized bees will start hanging out near the nest, exchanging pheromones and sharing food with the Europeans. Apparently, the European bees don't really notice what's going on because eventually the Africanized bees will take over, kill the queen, and establish their own queen as head of the hive. It's true that getting swarmed by hundreds of them can be deadly for humans, but that's because the bees are really defensive of their nests. They aren't seeking out and destroying us. The European bees aren't as lucky. Thank you to both of you and for all of you for joining us here on SciShow Quiz Show. We hope you enjoyed the ride. Please remember to take all of your personal items with you. <laughs> and if you want to see more from all of us, you can see our channel, which is all about the history of all of life on Earth, like how our planet might once have been purple was a recent episode. Mm -hmm. You can check out PBS Eons at youtube.com slash eons, which is a pretty freaking great YouTube URL, if I do say so myself.